All right. Um, just let's do a quick audio check. Can you give me a green check mark if you can hear me? All right. So we're getting a few texts coming in. Hey, thank you for joining us. Um, let me go ahead and move this slide. This is a session of the K-12 Blackboard Innovative Teaching Series. The K-12 Blackboard Innovative Teaching Series is designed to help K-12 educators reimagine education with Blackboard learning solutions. The K-12 Blackboard Innovative Teaching Series harnesses the power of our K-12 community of academic leaders, teachers, and other experts to provide relevant, uh, real-time, on-demand and ongoing professional development opportunities for K-12 educators. Okay, um, right. My name is Katie Gallagher, and I'm the Director of Teaching and Learning Solutions Marketing for K-12. And I'll be serving as the moderator for the K-12 Innovative um, Teaching Series, the K-12 Blackboard Innovative Teaching Series. Thank you to Jenny Breister from our K-12 Field Marketing Team, who will be helping answer questions today in the chat as well as to Melissa Merrick, our marketing intern for the spring. We'll be joining you for the Key Club Blackboard Innovative Teaching Series this spring, and we're always open to new ideas for the series. So please let us know if you have an interest in presenting a future session, or you have a topic uh, that you would like to see in a future session. You can always email me at katie.gallagher at blackboard.com. Okay. At each session and each webinar in the series will be recorded. You can search for the K-12 Blackboard Innovative Teaching Series playlist on the Blackboard TV YouTube channel or go to tinyurl.com slash bitsk12. You'll be receiving the recording and the presentation slides in a few days after the webinar by email. You'll also receive an invitation to participate in an online PLC designed to augment the series and create an avenue for ongoing collaboration and dialogue. So please accept the invitation and participate in the online PLC. As you can see, we have many exciting professional development sessions lined up this spring. Please join us again next Monday on April 6th for meeting the needs of all learners through individualized learning with Matthew Kruger Ross from the North Carolina Virtual Public School. You can go to bbbb.blackboard.com slash k12bits to register for a Monday session or any session within the series. Okay. And if you haven't done so already, be sure to download the BBK12 Live app for more professional development on demand. All the sessions in the series are, are fed into the app uh, so that you can access them and, and do PD from anywhere. Today, we're very pleased to have James Bell from NCVPS with us. He'll take us through kicking down the doors of online learning, collaboration among teachers. When teachers teach, collaboration between teachers is by far the best way to make sure students are receiving the best possible instruction. This collaboration is twofold. Teachers and teacher leaders should not only be sharing their best practices in online learning, but they should be giving away the best ways to share online in online teaching communities. Teachers need to kick down the doors of online education classrooms. Amazing things are happening in classrooms all over the Internet. It's time to pull back the curtains and give away the secrets. However, it's not enough to just give away what's going on in the online classroom. We also need to shed some light on the best ways to share those secrets. Um, by using online communities and e-learning communities, teachers can find new ways to reach students. In this presentation, James will use examples from the medical model the way physicians actually look at collaborations to show how teachers can fully leverage the power of collaboration in teaching. James is the 2008 North Carolina Teacher of the Year and works on professional learning at the North Carolina Virtual Public School. So welcome to James. And um, before I pass it over to him, just a couple housekeeping items. Um, if you've dialed in, be sure to mute your line unless you want to speak up and ask a question or, or share a comment. And we encourage you to participate in the chat in the session. We'll, we'll feed questions to James throughout the session. Uh, so don't be shy. We want to make this as interactive as possible. But if you're not speaking, you know, be sure to turn your talk button off or, and, and have your uh, phone line muted so we can have the highest quality recording uh, for the K12 Live app and, and for the YouTube channel. So thanks, everyone, for joining us today. And thank you in advance, James. We can't wait for your session. 
Well, thank you very much, Katie, and thank you, Jenny. I'd like first to thank both Katie and Jenny. I've had an opportunity to work with them a couple times in the past, and I miss you guys, so it's a great opportunity to be here and to be able to share a couple of ideas with the K-12 environment and the K-12 community. As we get started, um, I am James Bell. I work with North Carolina Virtual Public Schools, and I, I have many hats with North Carolina Virtual, uh, one of which is professional learning. It's the most recent hat that I'm wearing. And a lot of that is, it's been a lot of fun because a lot of what we're doing now is we are reaching out to pre-service teachers and current teachers across the state of North Carolina and getting them ready or getting them more prepared or adding to their toolboxes as it comes or pertains to teaching in an online or blended community or school for that matter. And that looks different for so many different schools, county to county, district to district in North Carolina what online teaching looks like and what blended learning looks like or blended teaching, they, it has a very different face. So we're dealing with a variety of ways that this is done and a variety of ways that this is looked at. So it's quite exciting. It's quite cutting edge. And it's quite, uh, it's meeting the students where they are. And it's been a lot of fun to be a part of that and to continue to be a part of that. Uh, but as we get going, as we get started, I have to share a little bit something about myself, which is why Bear Bryant happens to be on this page. I am in no way, shape, or form connected to the University of Alabama, nor am I a fan. However, um, as a teacher, I, I was a football coach for 13 of my years. And I would read a lot of legends of these great coaches in, in the history of football. And one of them was a legend of Bear Bryant. There was a story that Bear Bryant was playing, of course, Auburn, and Auburn was winning. And at, the, at halftime, he walks into the locker room, and he gives this just ridiculously inspiring speech to his team. And he talks about the weather, and he talks about the grass, and he talks about all of these wonderful things that are happening on the football field. And he's almost too peaceful to be Bear Bryant. Uh, apparently, Bear Bryant was usually very gruff and very angry at halftime and very mean, but he was very peaceful, and he's very calm, he's very kind, almost huggy and, and warm and fuzzy. As he turns from the team, he's just given this incredibly warm, fuzzy speech. He turns from the team, and the doors behind the locker room are closed. He turns around, and apparently he kicks the doors so hard that they fly off the hinges, and he turns back around, and he says to his team, it's a good time to play football. And they walk out. They have this amazing second half and come back to beat Auburn, so roll tide, whatever. I'm not a, an Alabama fan, but this, when I read this years ago, it started to change the way that I looked at teaching. The idea that we need to kick down these doors, the idea that schools have become segmented, and this was in a face-to-face -face world, this idea that um, all of a sudden we were in closed doors. Each one of our rooms were closed, and we were all in these rooms, and we were working really hard, and we were collaborating after school for a couple of minutes, or we might talk to the teacher down the hall for a few minutes about one of our students, but all in all, the doors were closed, and it was time to, to kick down those doors. That's what started me on this little mission of pulling back the curtains, and I started to think about when did this happen? When did schools become so closed, and when was it that all of a sudden teachers started to harbor their secrets, and they didn't want to share anything, and it was almost uber competitive to the point where I want to succeed but I don't want anybody else to succeed because I need to be seen as better. I'm not sure when that happened for teachers, and I'm not exactly sure why, but I know that it wasn't what was best for kids. When I was named North Carolina Teacher of the Year, we kind of had to have some platforms, and we had to start to do some research, and when we gave presentations and we gave speeches, we had to have a reason of what we were talking about. And one of the things that still was weighing very heavily, heavily on me was this idea that teachers had closed their doors. Now, about that same time, North Carolina Virtual was born. It's born in Cumberland County here in North Carolina, and I wasn't yet associated with them, but I was working with the current executive director on kind of promoting, not in a marketing sense, but just making sure that people were aware of this part of North Carolina education. And part of that was to make sure that we pulled back the curtains of what was going on. And it became incredibly important to not only talk about why is it important to collaborate in a face-to-face -face environment, but it became very important to talk about why we had to collaborate in schools. And it kept came, coming up that it was this collaboration amongst teachers that kept leading to the more successful schools. 
when we started to do research and we started to look at the schools that were being the most successful, what we kept noticing was that those teachers and in those schools, and especially those school leaders, those administrators, from the district level to the school level, when they spoke about and when they sang the praises of collaboration, and at that time all the craze was, you know, professional learning community. When they talked about PLCs, when they talked about what was coming out of those, the student results at the end of each of those years at those schools were higher. There was a clear co uh, correlation between collaboration amongst the professionals and success at the student level. It became very, very clear what we had to do both in the face-to-face -face world in North Carolina, but also what we needed to start to promote more and more in the virtual world as this cutting-edge way to teach kids was becoming more and more part of everyday education. It was no longer a supplement. It was no longer something that you pulled out of the closet, but online education was going to be a big part of what each one of these kids were doing. Um, it became very, very important and very, very clear that the relationships that teachers had bled straight down to the successes and the way that students learned and how well they did succeed. So we want our students to do this. We want our students to collaborate. We want them to learn in groups. We wanted them to learn in these centers. And all of a sudden, our kindergarten teachers got really, really good at putting our kids in environments where they were learning together and they were internalizing information, but our teachers still weren't doing this. And we couldn't quite figure out why. Why was it that the individual learning model was foreign for our kids, but our teachers still wasn't, they still weren't on board. And that became very obvious as well. The research was clear. The older the teacher was, the, the more time that was between them graduating from their universities or their colleges to the point that they were teaching, the less likely they were to collaborate in all of their planning for their students. The evidence was clear. The research was clear. So we had to start to change that. And so we started looking at different research models. We started to look at ways that we could actually make an impact and samples that made sense. We come across the medical model. There was a lot of grad work being done by grad students in different universities. And it all started for me in a conversation that I had in a hospital with a friend. So I was sitting in a hospital with a good friend of mine who had just had a series of blood clots. And the, the ER doctor that came in had zero experience with blood clots. He was a trauma doctor. He had experience with a lot of different things. But a guy coming into the ER on a Saturday night, it just wasn't something that he had seen a whole lot of. So as we're sitting there, he calls a friend who happens to be a physician. He happens to be a hematologist. He calls the hematologist. The hematologist comes in. The hematologist then calls an orthopedic surgeon. Apparently, a friend of mine had a couple of different surgeries on that leg a few years prior. And so now there's three physicians standing in a hallway, and they're all talking about one case. All three of them are sharing their lenses and their perspectives on exactly what's going on with this person, this friend of mine that's in the hospital. And each and every one of them has a slightly different take on what the causes are, what the treatment should be, what needs to happen from here on out, how he should leave the hospital, even to the point where there was a discussion about a compression sleeve pulled across his leg. The orthopedic guy was all for it. The hematologist said, no, you can't put any more pressure on those things. To make a long story short, a light bulb went on for me. And that light bulb was this. If it works in medicine, if it works in a hospital where we can get a series of professionals standing around a room, why does it not work in school? If we have a group of students or an individual student that we're having an, an issue with, as a teacher, if I can't seem to reach a particular student or I can't seem to get a particular concept taught in my classroom in such a way that everyone gets it, why am I trying to handle that on my own? Why am I standing there again with my doors closed and trying to figure out how to do this instead of reaching out to the community around me, the students around, uh, the teachers around me, the administrators around me, those who have been there before and those who have different lenses, and maybe we can reach those kids. So at about this time, I start grad school, and I have to do a research project, and I end up doing it on the medical model. And as the more and more I researched this, it was becoming more and more clear to me that this is where we need to be going in education, not necessarily exactly the medical model, but what we needed to do is we needed to start to collaborate in such a way that wasn't just venting. One of the things that I learned in my own personal uh, anecdotal research, visiting schools and talking with teachers, was 
teachers had a great ability to vent. At the end of the day or on their planning period, they would spend significant amounts of time venting their issues or venting the problems that they're having or the struggles that they were, were seeing in their classrooms. But what they weren't doing is they weren't getting down into the things like the data and, and stuff like that. So we had to shift the idea. We had to shift it more to collaborating in such a way that we were trying to get results for individual problems or groups of students that had a problem with getting a concept. A lot of times that fell on the teacher. Sometimes it fell on an individual student and they needed to work in a different way. But we had to follow this model where it took more than one adult, more than one professional, more than one teacher, or more than one team. If it was an administrative team, if it was a teacher team, but it took a group of people to teach a kid. The idea that it takes a village started to kind of rise out of this. And it kind of linked right back to PLCs. Again, they were all the craze a few years before, and there was definitely some merit to it. So the question then became, what is a PLC? And a lot of people knew this. We knew it was a group of people, and they're sitting around, and their idea was that they were committed to student learning, the idea that they wanted to engage in discussions and other activities that basically ultimately led to the success of students. And this was easy in a face-to-face in -face environment. The, a really good professional learning community, a really good PLC, would carve out time and planning periods, or they would carve out time after school. I even met some that were doing it before school because they didn't have time otherwise. And they sat down, and they sat down with specific problems. Again, those specific problems were students. Sometimes those specific problems were groups of students. But what they intended to do was look at those problems in depth, come up with a variety of solutions. Sometimes each teacher posed a solution. Sometimes it was one teacher who had then had success with a particular student or group of students or concept in the past, and they revisited that success. But no matter what the case was, it was a group of teachers and administrators who were committed to learning going on in that particular process. That was very easy, and it's becoming more and more commonplace in face-to-face -face environments. The problem is, is it as easy or is it as effective in virtual or online environments? Now, I think the answer to that is obvious. It's yes and yes. It is effective, and it is important. But how is it done? Well, at North Carolina Virtual, that's the only way we can do things. We basically only know how to do our PLCs online, and the ELC is born. It's the same thing as a PLC. It's doing all of the same things that were done in the face-to-face -face environment. Following that medical model in an ELC with online environments, all it was was how do we get environments so that all of us can meet the same groups of people, so groups of teachers, groups of administra administrators, groups of stakeholders, all for that committed for that one vision, student success. But how do we do that? What does that look like? What does it mean for a group of students who are struggling or an individual student who is struggling to have their teachers or their stakeholders or their administrators getting together and doing what's most effective for them to succeed? That becomes the challenge. So you have to create a culture in these online environments that is collaborative. So the first thing that has to happen is if you're using online environments in both blended learning or just online learning, you have to have an, a collaborative culture or an, a buy-in from the top down and the bottom up. Administrators have to be okay with this. Administrators have to be okay with walking into a classroom or walking into an environment where the adults are online. If it's a blended world, then they're going to be online with other adults during the planning period. It may not look exactly what they're used to. It may not look like four teachers sitting around a table with paper spread out in front of them. But that culture has to be there already. You have to build that collaborative culture from the very beginning. And so there has to kind of be an okay. There has to be an acceptance that things aren't going to look like they once did. And that's okay. That's how it's supposed to be. And this, there are some growing pains in that. I think something's out of order, but that's okay. Um, so we started looking at ELCs, and we started looking at PLCs. And as we did this, and as we added these ELCs to... The, some of the school systems that we piloted with, some of the blended learning situations that we went in through, we tried to ask the question, how often should these meet? Well, the answers were simple. How often do you need to meet? Remember that our students have certain needs, 
And the, the students in online environments had the same needs as the students that were face-to-face. -face. So how often were we meeting as PLCs? A lot of those models were, were written in books and it was once a week or whatever the case may be. And that was the same for ELCs. How often do ELCs meet? Well, how much, or what were the needs of the students? If the students' needs were being met with one meeting a week, then that was all that was necessary. If those needs still weren't being met, then we saw situations where we had teachers and, and administrators meeting more often. Now, the great thing about ELCs is nobody's driving. So you can always find a time as you can create that time, which is not as easy as it sometimes seems. But you can always find that space, the virtual land, where you can plop down and have that meeting and have those discussions. In the same way that we're doing right now, you can share things that need to be shared. We can share documentation. We can share data. And that kind of led to the next part is, what are we doing? What is it that we're doing in ELC? So one of the things that we decided that needed to be done at North Carolina Virtual, and especially our blended situations where we had teachers face-to-face -face and some teachers online, is we had to take some deeper dives into data. One of the great things about online courses is the amount of data that's generated. We already have test data. All of us have access to test data. We can talk about even teacher-created tests. We can talk about assignments and, and just general grade data that each one of our students has that face-to-face -face teachers and online teachers collect. That's the easy part. That's the given part. But some of the stuff that online and blended courses provide with us is, is really unique and interesting data. And it's, it's things like login trends. It's things like how long does each student spend in the course when they're in the course? What are they doing when they're in the course? What are they clicking on? Where is the, the, the attention being uh, directed? And we can take a look at those trends, and we can have teachers take a look at those trends and find out with that information where should they go next. So EMCs became an opportunity to start really taking deep dives into data that were never looked at before. It was easy to look at assessments and performances, and what we could also start to look at some of those really unique pieces of data. And then, of course, you know, there's always the individual questions. There's the, I have a student with these issues and those issues. So those are things that were taken care of as well. But to really take a look at the data was something um, that we saw ELCs doing that PLCs never really got into. And this continued to develop this idea that we had to be collaborative. We have these teachers who are working together hand in hand, both virtual, blended, online, face to face. They were all over the map, but they were working hand to hand, but they ultimately we were seeing success. So we still had this one problem, and, and that one problem was stemming from how do we do it? What does it look like? So there became this question about who's in charge, and nobody ever wanted to deal with that question. One of the models that we looked at that uh, was a lot of fun and we actually use a lot at, in, within North Carolina Virtual itself is we kind of rotate these who's in charge questions. And by doing that, we kind of have a semester by semester uh, leadership piece where someone takes charge and in, in that role they might schedule the meetings or they may actually um, have agendas put together or activities to to go through some information, and, and that's all fine. But it's not important. What's truly important is what's going on, what activities are taking place while they're leaving. So the next step, while looking at these chains of command, were kind of, it was more important about what they were doing. It wasn't important that they were in charge. It was about togetherness. It was about that co collaborative culture, and that's really what was important. So we have this phrase, and in that phrase is when you squeeze an orange, what do you get? You get orange juice. So what else can be done in an ELC that makes it unique, that makes it important? A lot of the things that we're seeing now are professional development modules. Uh, the North Carolina Department of Public Instruc Instruction provides a lot of that. And in that process, people go through modules together. They work on uh, becoming better, uh, the, you know, some skill set. It could be, uh, I know that one of them that a lot of teachers are going through now it involves actually being an administrator using a lot of these online tools. So they get some um, 
you know, they, they get some CEUs out of it and the whole thing. A lot of things that we're seeing now, I actually lead a few of these myself, are book studies across the state of North Carolina, fierce conversation type book uh, studies. Uh, there's one going on in North Carolina right now about what would uh, Google do. And then sometimes it's just the critical conversations. But when you squeeze that orange, when you really look into it, you have to get the good juice. And that's what ELCs become. It becomes an opportunity to get absolutely what you need out of it that's going to make those students successful. So, so as we move forward, and somehow, and it just seems a little disjunctive, I do apologize. I think my slides got out of order when I sent them to Katie, and it's certainly my fault, because uh, this should have been earlier in all of this. But one of the things that I want to, I want to start to engage you now as an audience. So I would like to know what you think the indicators are of a healthy learning environment. So I'm going to go to a poll, and if either Katie or um, Jenny can put the link in the chat, I would appreciate it. I'm going to go to a poll. I'm going to share my screen. I'd like to see what your responses are for what indicates a healthy learning environment. Um, and since we've already kind of gone through some of these things, what I'd like you to think about is in the idea of kicking down the doors of online education, what indicates a healthy learning environment? Uh, and, and James, your next slide, oh, okay, has it. If, if everyone goes to the link that I just uh, posted in the chat, you'll be able to participate in the poll. So this is a live poll, and this is, I guess, in a sense, I'm, I'm going to model a little bit of what, what you can do in these collaborative environments where you are online. What I'd love for you to do is if you think about the question, what are indicators of a healthy online learning environment? Um, if you can text in or use the link and just put some comments up there. And I'd like to have a bit of a conversation. And I don't know, um, Katie, I'm not sure if I'm allowed to do this, but I would love to uh, talk about some of these words. And I'd love to have some of the participants give their opinions on these words and or in, in some cases their fears and their reservations about uh, some of these ideas. Absolutely. Everyone can use your talk button and you can unmute your line to speak, but if you can, you know, start out by going to this web address and, and typing your descriptors into the poll. And I'll just wait a few moments while they start to pop up. Here we go. Fantastic. If you just paste it as it is, Hildy, into your browser, it should work um, with, with the line that I gave you. You shouldn't need a .com or anything at the end. And Katie, I can't see my screen anymore. Can you see the, the poll, the words popping up? Yes. We've got conversation and humor, consistent participation, acceptance, patience, um, openness, uh, collaboration, and, and fun. Great. So whoever is incredibly brave, um, if you would like to pick a word and talk about what that means to you, either, either reservation or celebration of that word, um, I would love to hear somebody raise their hand, unmute, and talk about that word and what what it might mean to them in a face-to-face -face environment, what it may mean to them in the environment in which they are now, and what it may mean to them in an online or blended environment. And I did just paste a new link. I'm not sure. I pulled it right from my browser. So I don't know how that happened. Um, but I did just paste a new link. So if you tried it and had trouble, try the new link. We're getting we're getting a new one with that sharing. I'll start. Um, I can't see. I cannot. I can see the poll. I cannot see the um, the uh, blackboard room right now because I'm sharing the screen. Um, but I want to talk about the word fun. And I know me well enough, I know most of you don't know me, I know me well enough to know that if it's not fun, I'm probably not going to stick to it. 
And so I think it's actually put up there. And when I kind of thought about this page, fun wouldn't have been the word that I would have put. I don't know if I would have been brave enough to put it up there, but I think whoever put that up there, that's absolutely correct. When you talk about teachers, and let's just, I'm going to go ahead and call myself, I was a middle school teacher for the greater part of my career. And the longer you teach middle school students, the more like a middle student you become. The more I was teaching middle school students, the more fun became important to me as a teacher. If I wasn't having a good time in these ELC or PLCs, at the time they were PLCs, I was disengaged when I got there. If we made it fun, if we made the environment more fun, we had a good time with each other, with one another, we became friends, and at the same time we were really working on what was important for the students, I was more likely to be not only engaged, but also to be providing uh, my best thoughts, my best ideas, my best lenses on how to solve that problem. I love the one that just popped up, mutual respect. I think respect is huge. In an online and blended environment, when you are doing an ELC, when you're having this collaboration, if anybody ever feels shot down, if their ideas ever don't feel at least respected and thought about, they will instantly, almost immediately, shut down and stop providing those ideas. That's human nature, but it's even more so in these online worlds where sometimes people seem to think that they're anonymous and they can shoot down other people's ideas without any kind of retribution. And I think that's a wonderful one. But I would love to hear from somebody else what their thoughts are on any one of these words or on the word that they put in. Feel free to, to use your talk button or unmute. James would like you to elaborate on any words that you've added in. Um, do we have a volunteer? I certainly could call on somebody, but that doesn't seem fair. We've got some folks typing in the collab chat, so let's see what comes in here. Um, Oh, too many things happening to unmute. Some books are home on spring break with a with a house full. <laughs> yeah, my daughter just came home and got off the school bus, and I had to greet her at the door with the universal finger over the lips, uh, please be quiet when you come into the house signal. So I understand completely. Somebody just typed in making mistakes without fear of retribution. And again, I think that is incredibly important. I think that goes along with respect and patience and openness, and these words are so wonderful. You guys have done such a great job. But there is this, this, this flow of ideas in an online world that can be so invigorating, and you can kind of throw spaghetti on the wall to see if it sticks. But we do have to be very careful that we respect each other because it's also very easy to shoot down those ideas. Uh, and without sometimes... I've learned this personally working with North Carolina Virtual. Sometimes when you don't have body language and sometimes you don't have inflection or tone if everything's through a chat, you sometimes accidentally say things in a way that you don't mean. And so I think we also, when we talk about uh, kicking down these doors and having this collaborative um, culture, we need to be very careful on, on the tools that we use, which we'll get into in just a few minutes. All right, well, for the sake of time, James, and I know I'm supposed to keep... There are a couple things. Coming in through the chat, um, Michelle Andrews commented that engaging in exploration are good contributions. She thinks it's very important to keep students active and interested. And Marie um, added that she put up humor, um, thinking it's much like fun, and we have to be able to stop and not take ourselves too seriously sometimes before we're able to see some solutions. Oh, and I agree. And I love the humor thing. Um, I have been working with some pre-service teachers from a, a university here. At, I'm not sure if they're a college or a university here in North Carolina. And one of the things that I have found young, not quite graduated, soon to be teachers as, is that they worry. They worry that if their idea isn't good enough or they worry if their, uh, their lesson that they've just designed isn't good enough. And I think you're exactly right. We have to be able to laugh at ourselves, not take ourselves too seriously. And in these online environments, we have to be able to take some constructive criticism. If, if you're going to put yourself out there and say, I need to be better, I need to reflect, I need to learn, I need to better serve my students, sometimes that means we're going to have to hear things that aren't exactly flattering. 
not in the sense of me personally, but maybe in something that I'm doing in the classroom that I could do differently. And I, I think you're exactly right. I think if we can do that with a little more humor and we have some fun when we do it, we accept each other's ideas. All of these words, this is just, it's absolutely wonderful and, and I'm, and I'm grateful for all of these. Um, um, for the sake of time though, I know that we are supposed to be done at, in, within a certain amount of time. I'm going to go and stop sharing for a few minutes and we'll take a look at that again in just a bit. Um, so there are indicators to a healthy learning environment. And those indicators are exactly the things that you guys just shared. All of those things are important, just like in a face-to-face -face environment, but they can be amplified and even more important in an online environment. And the reason for that is obvious. The tools that we use change the way that we communicate. The tools in which we use as, as administrators and teachers, leaders of our schools, it, it's going to be very different than when we have someone sitting in a chair across from our desk. When someone's sitting in a chair and across from our desk, we oftentimes have things like body language. We have all these other factors that are being read every second that we're in that, that moment in that meeting. Some of those things are absent when we're doing uh, virtual or online or blended um, collaborative moments. So The next question is always, and this is maybe the most important question, and, and quite frankly, this might be the meat of this presentation. And that is, is, if we're doing online and virtual environments, what tools are we using? Right now, everybody in this room is using a collaborative tool by Blackboard called Blackboard Collaborate. This is a tool that North Carolina Virtual uses daily. We use this for staff meetings. We use this for, um, I don't think there's anything we don't use it for. We meet with students this way. We meet with teachers this way. We have students who are taking foreign languages and they meet in these collaborative rooms to take their, uh, their, their coaching, their, um, their language coaching, where they actually just practice having conversations. There's a ton of useful tools to collaborate online. These are just a few examples. Obviously, Blackboard Collaborate is one. Google Hangouts is an easy one. VoiceThread is a great way if you're not going to do it um, synchronously. It's a great way to be asynchronous. And there are others. But what I'd like now to take a second, and I'm going to do this again. If you don't mind, I'm going to do another poll. And I'm, I'm very curious if you or either you, your colleagues, or your schools are using any of these um, collaborative tools. And we can talk a little bit about how they work, what their strengths are, what their weaknesses are. Um, and then talk about how to better use them in your day-to-day -day practices. So on this one, once again, let me clear these. And James, I'm still seeing slides and not seeing your application yet. Yeah, I was activating the poll first. Okay. And you should see you should see the page now. Yep, I can thank you. So what we want to talk about now, and I'll try to talk and do this at the same time. I know I'm getting close to the end of my time. What I want to talk about now are the tools. There are, like I said, there are a ton of tools. And I'm very curious what's already being used out there in your environments, in your K twelve schools. I know the um, the schools that I work with here in North Carolina, a lot of them are large counties. We have a county in central North Carolina. It's actually south, but it's kind of in the middle to me. And um, oh, we're doing this one in the word cloud, by the way. So this should be much more difficult to read. Um, the um, one of the things that they're doing, the county is so large. It's actually the largest landmass county in North Carolina that their principal meetings are done. In a, in a collaborative room. They don't actually travel back and forth to their schools to have these meetings. So there's a ton of reasons why these collaborative tools are important. Um, I see the Padlet's being used. Um, Hangouts is being used. Collaborate clearly is being used. We're all in a collaborate room now. Um, of course, Docs, that's a great way to collaborate. Does anybody use Google Hangouts for work? Adobe Connect, that's one that I have never actually used. I'm familiar with it, but I don't actually use it. Uh, 
are there any others? Um, the two big ones that I've noticed as we travel around, and I work with school systems here, are are LMS specific ones like Blackboard Collaborate, and the other one is Google Hangouts because it's free, and as long as you have permission to use it from your school system, which seems to be an issue for some, it's very easy to do. There are many tools. There are so many free and some purchase tools across the internet, across the web, that there's really no reason not to take full advantage of these. And I'm going to go ahead and close this now. Thank you guys for participating. Does anybody want to talk about the tools that they use? And I do see in the chat that people use their personal account. I actually do that too on some, only because it's easier. Uh, I find that if I do it that way, I can get the information easier, not have to work or go through uh, if something's lost or something's not working. So what I'd like to talk about now for just a second is um, I, I see in the chat that some people are using Google Hangout. The last one I'm reading, it says um, you use your personal account. So Google Hangout's working, but what needs to improve? If you were, if you had a group of teachers or a group of administrators using a particular collaborative tool, be it Hangouts, be it uh, Collaborate, something that one of the other LMSs uses, be it um, uh, non-synchronous or asynchronous tools like VoiceThread or um, Padlet, which can be synchronous, but it's also something you can go to later. What things are working in your school systems? I'd love to hear. And I'd really love it if, uh, if you just want to put in the chat, because I do understand that it's 4 o'clock and kids are home and homework's happening and maybe Ellen's on. I don't know. Um, what's working well and what things need to change or what things would you like for us to work on and maybe help you with or, or do another presentation on and just how can we improve specific things about collaborating in online environments? And Katie, am I am I correct in saying that I'm supposed to be done by 4:15? Is that right? Uh, uh, no, we have until 4:30. Oh, okay. But I thought you wanted the last 15 minutes. Oh no, no. We just we save time for questions. Whatever time is left, I need maybe one minute for my final two slides. No okay. worries. Okay. We're fine. Great. Time. Okay. So. Um, when you say specific examples, Marie, what are you talking about? Are you talking about how it can be used? Because I would be glad to talk, to, uh, we can talk right now about specific examples how, let's say, Blackboard Collaborate is used. Um, so one of the things that we do at Blackboard Collaborate North Carolina Virtual is, um, well, I'll call them departments. So let's say that we're a high school and um, but let's say that we're high school and we have department meetings. One of the things that we do with Blackboard Collaborate is we may have all the English teachers in one room, all of the foreign language teachers, or we may even break that down if they're working with something more specific in another room, uh, and so on and so on. And each one of those meetings, A, is recordable, just like what we're doing right now. They can be archived. So an administrator on their time can go and listen to those meetings and attend, in essence, even though they might not be attending each one live, they can go and attend those sessions afterward, see what the issues are, see what the celebrations are, listen to what's going on in their departments. A principal can actually attend every department meeting and never cut into their own time, never cut into their time where either they're with their families or time that's happening at school where they have to be involved in something else. So the timing becomes theirs. Um, another thing that you can do is you can bring in large groups of people into one place without ever having to pay someone travel. One of the things that um, that happens here in North Carolina is we have an advisory board uh, for e-learning. And as this has taken off, we have superintendents from school systems all across the state of North Carolina. Once a year, they meet face-to-face -face in the greater Raleigh area. However, three times a year, they meet in this environment online. So another great example is if you're moving people across your school system, across your district, you can easily get them in a room. Everybody can have a conversation. Again, it's archivable, it's recordable, so later on people can listen to it who weren't able to attend. And it's a great place to save money and have this meeting. And as you know, uh, as you can tell, you can put agendas in there, you can slide, you can put slides in there, 
You can do web tours in a room like Blackboard Collaborate, so you can kind of go through things if it's Google Docs that you're going through and there's a series of documents or anything online, as well as share each other's screens and be able to see what's going on. Another great way is actually tutoring. We do peer tutoring in North Carolina, and be it uh, Google Hangouts, um, Blackboard Collaborate, or any of the other rooms, um, we actually have one-on-one -on -one tutoring where we pair students up. We have a process where we have a certain set of students who are successful or just have a knack for coaching other students, and we put them in these rooms. Um, they actually do one-on-one -on -one tutoring sessions where they might spend anywhere from 30 minutes to an hour taking time, specifically working on the issues of that student. So the collaboration isn't just adults. It's also in our kids. Our kids are so naturally driven by this. It's what they're native to. They're not at all migrating into this world. They're already there. We're still catching up. So we also use it, like I said, we use it for um, tutoring and one-on-one and -on -one sessions. Uh, another thing that we do teacher-student-wise is that a lot of times if there's a small group of students who is struggling with just, I will throw out math three or some version of a math, math class, if there's a small group of students who are struggling with a concept, we can move them into a room, have them meet at a certain time. The teacher meets them in that room using the tools in the room. Again, doesn't matter if it's Google Hangouts, Blackboard Collaborate, or any of the others. They can use a tool within that room to reteach, to reassess, to recoach, to go through these concepts and make sure that the students that are in those rooms leave those rooms knowing what it is that they need to know to master whatever that concept is. So there's, there's, a, there's really no limit to how these rooms can be used. There's no limit at all to how the, the value, as you said earlier, the value that we can bring back to both administrators and schools and systems. This is a tool that is so powerful, and it works in so many ways. And I can't help but the, the thinking about, again, those three physicians standing in a hallway talking about one person's leg. If we had a group of educators and administrators and stakeholders and leaders sitting in a room again, be it Collaborator, Google Hangouts, or any of the others, sitting in a room talking about one student or one group of students and solving some significant issue and letting those teachers go back to the classroom, be it face-to-face -face or online, and being able to address those needs of those students with a whole new set of tools, with a sharpened tool or a whole new toolbox, and be able to make sure that those kids learn, and then meeting those kids where they are so they get to where they need to be. This is the power of collaboration online. It brings people together in such a way that they can share their ideas, just like all of those words that you guys shared a few minutes ago. It's fun. It's respectful. You bring all of those things together, and the students are the ones that benefit. I hope that's specific enough. If not, at the end, please, we can talk more about it, and or you can contact me later, and I'll be glad to share more with you. Um, so. As I wrap this up, if we want our students to learn collaboratively, we want them in groups, we want them both face-to-face -face sitting on these, in these centers from kindergarten up, and we want them doing it online, and we want them using all these great tools, and they already are doing it, our kids are doing more on their phone with groups of people than we ever imagined possible. We have to start to model that as teachers and as administrators and as school leaders, and, and this is kind of where it begins. It has to happen in these rooms. We can't ask our students any longer to be the only ones that are learning this way. Our teachers have to as well. Our administrators have to. And sometimes that teaching goes from the bottom up. It may be a group of teachers who are, who are comfortable with online learning and they're comfortable with collaborating in online environments, and they take that and it bleeds up instead of bleeding down and they get their own administrators from their schools involved, and those administrators get other administrators involved. And before you know it, central office personnel and, and superintendents are involved. And before you know it, adults are collaborating in an online environment, all with the sake of having students succeed. Remember in the beginning we talked about, or I talked about, we saw a clear correlation between schools that had collaborative cultures amongst their teachers and their success at any kind of end of grade assessment or end of course assessment. We have to continue to model that. We have to continue to grow that. And it happens in online environments. It's incredibly important in online environments. 
with that said, I'm James Bell. I work at North Carolina Virtual Public Schools. I'm the coordinator for professional learning. I also direct the non-public for a few more days. It's actually being handed off. It's going to be out of my shop. If you have any questions or any concerns, please feel free to contact me. I think we have a few minutes left, Katie. I would be glad to answer questions or have um, engage in any kind of discussion about online learning and collaboration and its power and its the way that it motivates adults and then ultimately has successful students. Awesome. Well, thank you so much, James. Um, let's see what questions we have coming. We have a couple of closing slides as well. But feel free to use your talk button or type in the chat or um, unmute on the phone line if you've dialed in. But we'd like to just open it up for general questions and comments. There's some typing going on in the chat. Can you see the chat now? I can, but it's um, I, all I see is uh, Mr. King putting the word thanks. I don't see any other um, um Marie, any other chat. Thank you for sharing as well. Getting new ideas, having current ones reinforced is very helpful. So there's definitely more more typing going on. I can see little chat bubbles, so more is coming in here. <laughs> We've got a fire alarm for some folks. <laughs> I thought fire alarms only ever happened on the 20th day of every month. Yeah. <laughs> I always knew as a teacher the 20th day of each month at about 2.30 there would be a fire drill. All right, so let's keep the questions and comments coming in through chat. I'm, I'm going to go ahead and um, just um, finish the last two slides here uh, before we close out because we're getting mostly thank yous. But just again, if you haven't done so already, be sure to get the BDT Club Live app, share it with your colleagues. It's absolutely free. Best sessions from DB World plus all of the, the Blackboard T12 Innovative Teaching Series sessions. Um, and you know, be sure to join us on Monday uh, for another session by uh, uh, one of James's colleagues at NCDPS. Um, we'll be focused on Monday. Matthew. Yes, Matthew, meeting the needs of all learners through individualized learning. Um, again, you can reach out to me with sessions you'd like to see or if you'd like to present in the future at one Katie Gallagher or Katie.Gallagher at Blackboard.com. We wanted to thank everyone for taking time out of their day to day to join us and um, very much appreciate your time and expertise as well, James. Thank you so much. And again, no. Uh, thank no, you guys for having me. Anytime. We, we can keep the questions coming in. I'm not trying to, to stay for that conversation, but you know, if, if if folks are done asking questions, you can have time back in your day. Great. Lots of thank yous and positive comments coming in, Jane. All right. Thanks so much. Looks like we're good for the day. Thank you, James. Yeah, thank you guys. Uh, Jenny, Katie, it was good seeing you guys again. Hope you